that it is a great uh, pleasure and also honor to be able to wish you a happy birthday. Uh, I had the uh, a great, again, privilege and honor to work with Yvonne Choquebrua during the last five years or so about the characteristic coffee problem. So what I would like to do today is to, uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, <laughs> I would like to report on some work we did together and on work which evolved out of our joint collaboration. Uh, so the uh, recent results I'm going to talk about are in collaboration with my uh, PhD student, Tim Petz. I think this is probably the bottom line of my or the punchline of my talk, uh, which says the following. Uh, if you have a smooth, light cone without conjugate points uh, on this funny set, I'm going to explain what this means. Then this is the formula for the something called the troutman bondi mass. And so, uh, well, this is the mass. This is uh, pi, 3, 1, 14. <laughs> uh, well, this is an ex something I'm going to explain to you what it is. Uh, I'm going to explain what this is. I'm going to explain what this is. I'm going to explain what this is. Uh, why is it interesting? Well, you will notice that everything here is positive, right? So it's in vacuum. So if you want to prove that the Bondi mass is positive, well, it's here. Okay, that's your proof. So uh, let me start. Uh, to tell you what is M. Now, uh, in uh, 58, Troutman, and in 62, Bondi published papers where they tell you how to calculate the mass of a null hypersurface. So suppose you have uh, some space time, and in this space time you have a surface which is null and goes all the way to infinity. Then they told you what is the right expression for calculating the mass of this object. I'm not going to explain you how they invented it, that and so forth. And I'm not going to tell you what this mass is uh, in their setting. I'm going to tell you how it's going to be in the setting which I'm, uh, of, of the light cones. And that's going to explain you also these symbols there. But in any case, there is this notion of mass, which uh, has been defined by uh, Troutman and Bondi. And it is some kind of limiting integral uh, as you go to infinity. So this is m is the limit as r goes to infinity, 1 over 60 pi of integral over S2 of some expression built out of the metric, which uh, they tell you what it is. And, uh, and this is this uh, troutman bondi mass. So this is something you associate to any null surface. Well, I'm not going to work with any null surface. I'm going to be uh, interested in null surfaces which are actually light cones. So they, uh, you take a point in space time, and you shoot light rays from this point, And this is the null surface I'm going to look at. OK, so what is known about this, uh, let's say, troutman bondi mass? Well, first, it is already known then it is positive. So m is positive if uh, the light cone, so the surface, well, I'm not, this is a little more general. You don't need to have this light cone here in their setting. So the, you can just think of this uh, asymptotic region of this characteristic surface. So this mass is positive if uh, the light cone, if n is asymptotic to a well-behaved hypersurface. So in other words, you have a space-like hypersurface. So if you have a space-like hypersurface in here, which has the same asymptotics, then uh, this thing is positive. OK, so this is something which has been, which can be proved by using uh, the Wheaton equation, so Wheaton type of proof. So this statement is much more general than 
than mine here because mine is just tied to, to light cones. Okay? So there is no issue uh, at that uh, this needs to, the positivity needs to be established. Uh, this simply gives you a very simple and uh, elementary proof of positivity. Uh, well, uh, one other thing which is known is that this uh, Troutman Bondi mass is decaying. If, uh, if you move uh, surfaces to the future, right? So if you take another surface, which is the future to this one, then its mass will be smaller. Uh, this also means that if you go backwards, the mass will be larger. So in fact, if you have proved that the mass is positive on this cone, you know it's positive for everybody before. Okay? So you get uh, more than just the proof on the on the cone. Well, uh, this is a question mark, but it is expected that the limit, as you go with this, uh, uh, so suppose that you, you can think of this surface as being u is equal t minus r, and as you go to, you push this surface down, so you go with u to minus infinity, uh, so uh, of this troutman bondi mass is the ADM mass. Well, this hasn't been proved, to my knowledge. There is a paper by Ashtekar which proves something like that, assuming a lot of things about the asymptotics of the space-time, a lot of things which we do not know whether they're true or not. So uh, presumably, and I think it's physically reasonable to expect that this will be true, but then, of course, uh, as I've told you, uh, uh, well, if you go backwards, the mass only increases. So this limit, if it is positive at late time, it's going to be positive always. And therefore, you get an elementary proof of the positivity of the ADM mass as well in this setting for any smooth, in a space time where you have a smooth light cone without conjugate points. So this is the my formula or our formula for the troutman bondi mass. Uh, well, there's one other property which I could mention here that this uh, troutman bondi mass is actually unique. <laughs> unique uh, when, uh, so unique functional of the field assume, uh, which satisfies two, satisfying two, and uh, and, and invariant under something called super translation. So, so, so this is a, an interesting object by, by its uniqueness properties. Uh, one more last comment here is that, uh, uh, well, since uh, this thing decays, uh, and all these things are positive, you get explicit bounds on these integrals on null surfaces in your spacetime. Okay? So this is something which could be useful for studies of uh, uh, stability of black holes or other things like that. Uh, well, I have written this uh, formula in the case where your surface starts from a point, but of course if it started from initial data, uh, you could uh, you get a boundary term here coming from initial data which you control. So you get some uh, energy type uh, quantity which uh, perhaps might be useful to say something more about the dynamics of your space time. It's uh, certainly bounded for all later times. Okay, good. So now I've ex kind of explained to you what m is and 16 pi is. Uh, let's see, so maybe I should start with sigma. And to tell you what sigma is, let me just go back and tell you something about the Cauchy problem in general. And uh, well, let's take the simplest equation possible, Laplacian phi equals zero. Well, the space-like Cauchy problem, you have to give uh, your initial data on the surface 
uh, and uh, its time derivative on the surface, you get a solution. Uh, if you are on a light cone, which I'm going to assume uh, from now on for these hypersurfaces, uh, if you want to solve this equation, so you only prov provide as initial data phi and c0. Okay, so that's how you solve the wave equation. That's the difference between the space like Cauchy problem and the problem on the light cone. Uh, you just you don't give the function and its derivative, you only give the function, and uh, plus some regularity at the vertex, which is well understood. Good, so this is uh, for the wave equation, for Einstein equations. Well, this is something that Yvonne has taught us. If we have a space-like surface, what we can do is just give the full metric on the surface. All the time derivatives of the metric at the surface. Well, these things are not quite free because there is a four relations called the constraints, which specialists know. And if you don't know the area, it's no much point that I write them. But there's four relation between the space part of the metric and uh, the time, well, well, it's roughly speaking, between these objects. It's not quite true, but that's essentially this, right? So you give all the components of the metric, all the time derivatives. They have to satisfy four, four relations called the constraint equations. You get a solution out of this. Now, uh, in the, on the light cone, you get, if you give me g mu nu uh, at uh, uh, on this cone, and one relation, which I'm going to explain shortly, and regularity at the vertex, then you get a solution. So, so the claim is that, uh, so here is your light cone, you get initial data, and there is a subset of, uh, well, there's a neighborhood of a specific subset of the light cone where you get a solution. So this is uh, uh, the picture from a PD point of view. Now, if you want to do it, the geometric picture here, uh, well, one often thinks that rather than giving this two, one gives gij and uh, something called Kij, which is related to these derivatives, and four relations, okay, so plus constraints. Uh, so in other words, well, the extra data here, are, which you're free to prescribe, are just uh, gauge artifacts. So you choose them whatever you want them to be, uh, and for different data, you're going to get the same solution up to them up to, uh, up to uh, isometry. Now here, the geometric data will be something which I'm going to call GAB and uh, a f connection coefficient kappa. And so this constraint equation. So, so let's see. Uh, so the G bar ABs, what are those? Well, if you... Uh, if I have a null surface, I have uh, I can induce from this space-time metric a tensor field on this surface, and so this tensor field I'm going to call g g g, uh, g bar, and this is so uh, a two uh, um, two covariant symmetric tensor field of signature uh, zero plus plus. And the zero is coming from the fact that this is an all surface, so there is an all direction involved, okay? So this is my uh, G bar here. Now, I and if I use coordinates Rxa adapted to this null direction, then J will have no dr square component. It will have no dr 
dxa component, and it will only have angular components. Okay. So this is the uh, g bar. And what is kappa? Well, in this coordinate system, if you want to look at the associated space time, this is a connection coefficient here. Uh, it's telling you the following. Well, d over dr is a null vector on this null, on this null hypersurface. Uh, so by standard result, it is uh, uh, autoparallel, right? So if you start moving it uh, along itself, it's going to be parallel to itself. So kappa is this uh, connection coefficient related to here. And the constraint equation is the Rajaduri equation. which says that dr kappa plus uh, tau kappa plus one half sigma square uh, plus, uh, is this plus, is this minus? Actually, it's minus here. Minus kappa tau plus one half sigma square plus, plus sigma square plus one half tau square equals zero. So, uh, well, you know already what kappa is. This is this connection coefficient here, which, by the way, you can set to zero by choosing your uh, r appropriately, but uh, well, you don't have to. Uh, and uh, uh, so this is the equation. Now, what is sigma? Well, I have to define something which was called, I think, kappa uh, chi plus in the last lecture. And uh, it's in my, lect it, in my notation just chi. This is going to be the radial derivative of this, 1 half dr gab. Uh, so then sigma, well, tau is something which was called trace chi plus in the previous lecture. And it's often called theta or theta plus. Uh, and this is uh, the trace of this thing with respect to this two-dimensional metric. So uh, as I said, most of the literature uses the symbol tau, tau, tau or tau plus. Well, Yvonne has told me that I have to use tau when he started working on this sign following what I've been told. And uh, so sigma will be just the trace-free part of chi. So sigma AB would be, it's called the shear. It's uh, so chi AB minus 1 half tau GAB. Good. So this is the Rajaduri equation. And this is the only constraint in the theory. And why, uh, and there is, for my purposes, there is a, a stuff, useful observation is that if uh, tau is positive, then I can just get rid of this equation in a, uh, okay, good. This is better, sorry. <laughs> good, if tau is positive, then I can just solve this equation trivially for kappa and get rid of the constraint. Okay. So, uh, so kappa would be. But you have to, I do the uh, expanding direction, but you need a, a, a plus there, kappa times tau. You know, I, 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 don't, I don't care. I don't care here, but I think. Let me just check. Maybe you're right. Uh, no, I think it's all right. Kappa is negative. Whatever it is, as long as tau is positive, uh, I can just solve the equation in a stupid way by writing that this is 1 over tau dr tau plus sigma square. And uh, so maybe I have a, a sign wrong here, right? That's cool. Let just. No, I think it's okay. Oh, well, uh, if well, if 
if tau is non-zero, whatever the sign and coefficient there, uh, I can always do this, right? And I have solved my, uh, my uh, constraint. And then in, some, in this sense, uh, this is the same as uh, just giving G. Okay? So the initial data, I can freely prescribe this tensor G square AB, which is a geometric object. And uh, this turns out is good enough to determine the whole solution in this tau larger than zero case. Now, of course, the assumption tau larger than zero is restrictive. And, uh, uh, but when you have a smooth light cone, you necessarily have tau larger than zero. But you see, in Minkowski space, you have a cow will be uh, 2 over r. So it, be, it has to be dr tau plus 2 over r tau. In Minkowski space, time kappa is 0. And so whether it's plus or minus doesn't matter. <laughs> tau is 2 over r, but kappa is 0. Kappa is the acceleration. Right? So kappa is, is this. Tau is. 2 over r in Minkowski, and uh, in the standard parametrization, kappa would be 0 in Minkowski. But something like <coughs> now, why does this have to be true if you have a, a smooth light cone? Well, uh, you, if you take a general space time and start shooting geodesics from some point, uh, these things will start intersecting. So even though the thing was smooth at some stage, uh, I, I don't think I know how to draw this, but uh, in general, light cones, you expect, well, in general, in many situations, you expect light cones to stop being smooth because geodesics will start intersecting. Therefore, uh, any theorem of this kind for any smooth light cone without conjugate points is going to be restricted. In fact, you can ask, uh, are there any space times at all which are reasonably well controlled and which have smooth light cones? And uh, Helmut explained to me once that this is true and follows by a kind of Corvino gluing construction with small data space times. So uh, there isn't any issue. But it is a byproduct of what we're doing here that there's a lot of space times here anyway, just directly can be constructed using these data. So uh, now, what is the story about tau order equals 0? Well, this is actually rather easy to see from this equation. If you take, uh, uh, once you have, well, suppose when you have, li when you have uh, light rays, you can always parametrize them so that kappa equals 0, right? So this term is a gauge dependent thing. You can always get rid of it, regardless of, of this story out there. So if I do this, that I see from this equation that tau is a, a monotonously decreasing function. Right? So this is positive. So the derivative of tau is negative. So tau is decreasing. Now, if you have a light cone in an asymptotically flat spacetime, for large distances, tau will be behave like, in Minkowski, 2 over r will be positive. So whenever you have an asymptotically flat spacetime with a smooth light cone, then necessarily tau will always be positive everywhere. Okay. So this hypothesis that tau is larger than 0, I get it for free if I know that there are smooth light cones in my spacetime. And then I can call, uh, solve kappa using this equation. And then once I know what kappa is, I can change my R parameter so that this uh, kappa becomes 0. Okay. So uh, after doing this, change r and get a equation, right, Chaduri equation, which tau equals 0. And so get uh, right Chaduri with kappa equals 0. Good. Well, so at this stage, at least you know what sigma square is. 
now here I'm assuming that R is a, I am in this kappa equals zero gauge, okay? So I started with any G square AB. Uh, I am assuming that this derivative, so that this function here, uh, G square AB, dr g square ab is positive. I can solve for kappa and go to a geodesic parametrization where kappa is zero, so then this field is manifestly geodesic. Uh, now, uh, let's see. So I can tell you now what psi is. I should have written before. So psi is just an explicit integral. Did I? Ah, OK, good. Well. So you know what psi is now, right? So this is your tau. This is 2r, which is coming from light cones in Minkowski spacetime. And so this is this expression here. Now, what is this phi? The phi is the only thing I cannot, I don't know right uh, offhand how to give you an explicit expression for. But I can tell you how I can construct this. Uh, what you have to do is you solve the equation uh, d r square phi minus sigma square phi uh, the coefficient here uh, I think m maybe there's a 2 here or something like that equals 0 with the condition phi equal 0 at 0 and d phi over dr at r equal 0 is 1 and uh, then uh, this big phi would be uh, lim as r goes to infinity of uh, phi over r. So when you play a little with this equation, it's rather simple. Uh, you can see that this limit exists and is uh, larger equal zero. So the only thing you need to worry about is uh, phi equals zero, right? Because if capital phi is zero, I have a problem there. So uh, what I'm saying is to obtain this formula, uh, there are two restrictive conditions I need to impose. First, the tau is positive. And, the, and second, that phi, which could perhaps vanish in some direction, is positive. Okay. So if I take any initial data like that, which are asymptotically flat in the usual sense, so g square a b, g bar a b, this is the angular part of the metric, so it has to decay to Minkowski spacetime at large infinity in a suitable sense, then s soon as I have these two properties, I have this uh, formula for the troutman bondi mass. Uh, now, uh, for the experts, uh, just a comment on, on, on this. Uh, wait, 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 wait. OK. <laughs> It's actually xi, it should be xi, but uh, yeah. Uh, this, uh, uh, so if you think uh, in terms of your conformal completion, so you have your scry plus here, and you have your light cone emanating from a point, and you're assuming that this light cone is globally smooth in space time, so there are no conjugate points and no self crossing or anything like that, then when you're getting to scry plus, the thing which could perhaps happen is that you get a conjugate point sitting exactly on scry plus. Okay? So if you do all your scaling, it's not an infinite from light cone anymore, but it's a light cone at finite distance. And you could have a conjugate point which sits precisely here. And this would correspond to phi, capital phi equals zero. Okay? So, uh, so I have to exclude this possibility, right? So I, get a, I have to assume that my light cone is smooth, and there isn't a perverse uh, thing which happens precisely at square. OK, so we don't know what xi is. Well, it looks like zeta, but it's scan. It's 
it's actually xi. Okay. Now xi uh, is uh, whatever you need more uh, to have a complete connection in the d over dr direction. So if you write dA d over dr, well, there's a funny normalization which we which we use. Okay, so uh, kappa together with psi are just the connection on the inter on the uh, space on the bundle uh, spanned by d over dr. Okay, so that's your psi here, and now this psi. You can calculate it out of the initial data. There's an equation for it, which I'm not going to write down. Or actually, well, I can just write it for you, but it's, it looks like something like that. dr plus tau uh, psi a. Well, modular coefficients, you get something like that. Plus dl uh, tau plus da kappa equals zero. Okay, so in vacuum, you get an equation like that, which uh, if you're given kappa, uh, which we have, and if you're given tau, which we have, because this is this trace of the chi, and you're given sigma, which we have, because it's the trace free part of psi, we can just integrate this equation starting from the tip of the light cone, and we get our xi out of this. So. So now you know all the ingredients. And uh, well, let me show you how you prove this formula, because it's really elementary. Uh, where do I get more blackboard? Probably just pulling this down. Say it again. What is the definition of M? Right. So uh, the, the definition of M, well, you take uh, any textbook with, uh, which has a Bondi expansions, and you get a, a formula, which I told you, but I'm going to give you the formula in, in, uh, when you translate it to this formalis. Uh, have a something. Oh, okay. And so, you know, I mean, this is so simple. I, I can't believe that this isn't already somewhere in the literature. Uh, that, uh, so if someone has seen this formula, I'd be glad to see it. Because I mean, how could people have overlooked it? But uh, OK, so well, there's a calculation which uh, you take, uh, as I said, Take the uh, Bondi definition, right? So Bondi's definition. And you're going to get that the mass is equal 1 over 16 pi. And there is a, a, a new symbol, which now is zeta, coming in. OK, so this is. You can just believe me, there's a calculation you have to do. You don't, still don't know what zeta is, so it obviously can't be wrong. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you what zeta is. Uh, and what is tau 2? Well, if you are asymptotically flat, then tau is equal. The mean constant at for large distances behaves like the uh, expansion of light cones in Minkowski, which is 2 plus over r plus a correction term, which decays like r square, plus higher order terms. Okay? So this connect correction term tau 2 is the thing which appears here. And uh, what is zeta? Well, zeta, it's again one of these, uh, there's an equation for zeta, which is uh, important and, uh, well, which you'll see the positivity coming out of it right away. Uh, which says that dr plus tau zeta plus the 
curvature of this two-dimensional matrix uh, GAB minus one half uh, my psi square, and this is exactly this term, one half over two coming there, and plus a divergence of of uh, this psi is zero. Okay, so this is one of the equations you get out of the Einstein equations, which determines my function zeta. By the way, I should say that zeta is actually uh, the following. Well, once you have your light cone and you have the light, the cross section of this light cone, then I've told you that tau is the divergence of the light cone in this direction. Zeta is actually minus the divergence in this direction. And don't ask me why. I mean, this notation, psi and zeta, is coming from our joint work with Yvonne. And so it's just for, I'm keeping it for historical reasons. Maybe if I had to rewrite everything, I would use those notations. But, but in any case, this is one of the Einstein equations that you're going to get uh, in vacuum. So you can integrate this equation with, well, with the right boundary values at the origin. And uh, uh, in fact, for small r, you know that uh, zeta is equal minus 2 of r plus o of 1. And for large r, just by analyzing this equation, see, once you know zeta, you can calculate this, you can calculate this. You know the two-dimensional metric, you can calculate this. You know what tau is, you just integrate radially, and you get zeta, right? And uh, so for large r, uh, zeta is equal minus 2 over r plus a square, uh, a term over r2 plus o of r minus 3. Okay. So, so now, zeta 2 is this coefficient uh, which appears in the expansion of zeta for large r. So let's start again. You, you give me a g square a, b, and a kappa so that tau is positive. Okay? And this is a necessary condition for a smooth light cone, anyway. Then I can calculate kappa from an equation which I probably erased, and then go to a gauge where kappa equals 0. Then I can solve the equation for zeta, which have I erased it? Or no, it's already it's somewhere. I erased it. No. For zeta, not uh, for for psi. Sorry, for psi. Thank you. Right. So I can so integrate psi. Once I know psi, I can integrate zeta. I can calculate the asymptotic expansion of these things. So I can find this coefficient here. I know the coefficient of expansion of tau here. I plug it in this integral, and I'm going to, this is my mass. Okay. So uh, by the way, this, this is obtained by transforming uh, Bondi's uh, expression into expressing Bondi's expression in this framework. Right? So Bondi is assuming various coordinate conditions, so you have to build them in. And if they're satisfied, you're going to get this expression. And now this expression involves only things which are intrinsic to this hypersurface because it's only in, everything has been defined in terms of g, uh, g bar AB. Right? Okay. Everything I did here, starting from g bar, I can obtain. So I don't care what's happening with coordinates of, of the surface or anything like that. And I could just say, well, this is a definition of the mass, which would be a silly thing to do. but. Uh, I could do this without, uh, uh, but in fact, it is exactly the same as Bondi's mass when Bondi's mass is defined. So, for example, in space times with smooth squaring. Good. So now we want to know how to prove this. Uh, that should be, uh, let's see how I'm doing with time. Okay. Yeah, well, I, I, I don't need to, yeah. So I probably just, uh, I need 10 minutes to. Or, or less to finish the proof. I stop there. So I need the right degree equation. I don't want to erase it. Uh, well, you see, uh, this, uh, the, this equation produces positivity when you integrate it over spheres. 
for a very simple reason. The divergence goes away, because if you integrate the divergence, it goes away. And you can use gauss bonnet to integrate r bar and to get something simple. And this is our positive term. Okay. Now, this term tau zeta here is exactly what you need when you're differentiating an integral uh, of zeta d with respect to the physical measure because you're going to get a term which is the derivative of zeta and the derivative of the measure produces exactly this tau square tau term so if you use the equation you're going to find that this is minus integral of r bar which is uh, 2 pi 4 pi 8 pi 8 pi 8 pi right. on a sphere 8, because r is not the Gauss curvature, but the scalar curvature, which is 2. Okay. So this produces 8 pi. Uh, the minus xi square term becomes plus 1 half integral xi square, and the divergence goes away. Okay. So I have this very clever idea to write this as the integral of S2 of xi plus 8 pi r is equal one half integral xi square. Okay, good. Now, this thing turns out to extract this coefficient of this integral when you integrate, go to infinity, right? So integrate at zero by the boundary condition, the vertex, you get zero. At infinity, there's something amusing which happens, uh, which says, I don't need this equation. that if I integrate lim as r goes to infinity of integral of zeta plus i p r is well you think that this is integral over this s sphere of z2 actually not quite you get minus 2 tau 2 and this is easy to see well or roughly uh, how does this go uh, for large r, zeta behaves like minus 2 over r. Okay? So in this integral, when you look at the leading order behavior, we're integrating minus 2 over r over a sphere. You get 4 pi from the area. The 2 gives you 8 pi with a minus. So, uh, and from the area, you get 4 pi r square, which cancels out 1 r. So the leading order term is minus 8 pi r. Okay, fine. So this cancels this one. Now, uh, there is a subleading order term, which comes from the fact that you're integrating 1 over r against not the space, the flat space-time measure, but the physical measure. And you do the calculation, this produces this. So in other words, when you, if I call this, one, then my mass is one over sixteen pi. One, which is positive, right? Because of this, this is my first integral over there. Plus, and, and now, well, minus because I had a in this formula for m, which vanished somewhere. Okay, well, here, right? So I have integral of zeta two which is here. I have minus 2 tau 2 and plus tau 2, and I get minus integral of tau 2. Okay. So now it's a question of, I think uh, I have five minutes. I could do it in three minutes. But uh, uh, you can just believe me that if you take this equation here with kappa equals 0, and uh, you integrate it in a uh, clever way, then this coefficient tau 2, which is coming from this integral, is exactly this thing. Okay. So that's all there is. And this is how you prove that the Troutman bondi mass is positive using uh, a lot of ideas which Yvonne helped me understand uh, and which. Uh, which uh, uh, okay. <laughs> 
But we, we developed together this formalism uh, to understand the light counts. Okay. Okay. The Right. Because when, when I suggested this to you, you said, this is, I don't want to do this. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Question, please. What happens if you try to do this without vertex? Do they have just get boundary terms from the... Yeah, so this is, uh, I've tried to, because obviously, well, first, if you have just a null surface coming out of initial data, then you get a boundary term, which you control by the initial data, and you get this formula with boundary terms. The, the term here is obvious, because if you're integrating this, then you're going to get this at the initial value. The other one is a little more messy, but you can work it out. And I wish I understood it, because uh, if I did, there could be perhaps uh, some kind of Penrose inequality floating around. But I, uh, yeah, so that's something I'm thinking about, and I certainly like to understand. There is this work of Marixakis uh, and Charles. How does it compare? How does this compare? No idea. Does it compare? Do, do they look at the body mass? Do they prove positivity? OK, good. I didn't know this. Good. OK. Do they assume small data, or do they assume? No, I, I, they, well, they, they have to make certain assumptions on the light on, like, you know, you have to make two, right? Because you don't have that. Good. Well, if, if, as I said, I mean, I'm, so I'm so astonished that this has been overlooked. I've never seen it before. So um, I'm just, uh, you know, proving non the mass. Positivity of mass is usually a big deal, and you do complicated things and things like that. No, you don't have to do this in this setting. Right, of course, but yeah, it's also obviously proof. Yeah, so I certainly uh, have a look at this reference, a, a recent paper by uh, Shao and Aretakis. Alex Akis. Alex Akis. Okay. Spiros. Okay, good. Yeah. Please? Uh, sorry, so, but, so the sigma and uh, xi, in the end, they, are, they are the square of connection coefficients, right? So, uh, but they are defined with respect to uh, the foliation of the... Uh, right. So the foliation is fixed rather rigidly here by, uh, uh, well, first uh, the uh, pa parameter is uh, an affine parameter on a glide cone. And uh, you're fixing the uh, asymptotic behavior of the metric. And uh, so, yes. So there, there is some freedom left, and, uh, but, uh, well, that's what it is in this case. And so you're saying for this is a specific choice made at infinity? Yes. Yes, I'm assuming that the metric goes to, uh, well, it's as, this, this, in, this G square AB is asymptotically Minkowskian in usual sense that people assume. Yeah, yeah. All right, so this determines a lot of normalizations here and some irrelevant one, which ob obviously should be not relevant for those integrals. But. More questions? Okay, okay thank you.